Okay guys, a little video here, um, test equipment video. On the bench I have a Tenma, if that's how you pronounce it, 72-585 RF signal generator. This was my very one of my first signal generators um, I got and I bought it brand new through a company called MCM Electronics. Um, there are about three or four different places that sell this. Uh, you can get it under different names. Uh, B&K Precision and a couple other companies have rebranded this uh, model. And they have different model numbers. But basically, this is a very common out there. You can get them on eBay. You can get them, like I said, here in the United States. You can get them at MCM or Newark. Uh, several different vendors. But if you do a search for it, you'll see it out there. Um, the reason I've gotten away from using this, I really, let's talk about what I like about it. Number one, it is extremely simple. When you look at this thing, if you're just getting into the hobby and you don't want to fiddle around with some of the older tube type signal generators like the ICO 324 or, you know, those kinds of things, this is a really good solid state solution. As you can see on the oscilloscope, it has a very clean sine wave for RF. Um, and it has all the basic things you would need to work at least on AM radios. Uh, for instance, you have a range all the way from 100 kilohertz all the way up to 150 megahertz. So that's a pretty broad range. You can actually do a unmodulated carrier um, in the FM broadcast band if you want, you know, between 88 and 108 megacycles. Now, certainly not going to be, you know, it's not going to be a sweep signal or it's not going to be a modulated signal for FM, but you can use the carrier to set up some parts of lower end FM radios. Um, you have an external modulation input and you can put different signals and modulate the uh, RF however you want which is another option so then if you get a I would imagine I've never tried this but if you get one of those really low cost online sweep generators you know arbitrary function generators like a low frequency one that will only go up you know a couple megahertz those can be had on eBay pretty inexpensively and you could modulate this signal and get all kinds of different modulated um, carriers within that, you know, 100 kilohertz to 150 megahertz bandwidth. Now, on harmonics, technically this thing should be able to, on, on this setting, go from 96 to 450 megahertz on harmonics. Okay, so this is all good stuff. You have a high and low attenuation. And you have a fine adjustment for the output, as you can see on the scope. Those are all good things. Now, what are some of the, and and you have an external crystal, so you could put a a resonant crystal in there and set it to crystal oscillator, and you'll have a uh, you know you'll have a really rock solid signal at that frequency of the crystal. So lots of options with this thing for be in such a low-end unit. Now, a couple of the bad things. Why did I stop using it? Well, first of all, when you're working with F, when you're working with RF, especially with radios, a lot of times you're using, especially with these AM radios, like a tube set or even a, a you know a transistor set that you're working, you're usually setting your IF and everything with a minimum signal. The problem with the minimum signal is you really can't hook up test equipment to measure the frequency. So if I wanted to put a frequency counter on this, I couldn't at low signal. Um, now why would I want to do that? I can just set the dial gauge. Well, here's the thing. If you look right here, I don't know if you can see, let me try to just temporarily zoom you in on the scope. If you look what it's saying right here, I don't know if, can you see that? I hope, right there. Right here is what we're interested in. You can see that I have a 1.5 megahertz RF sine wave on there right now. Let me back you back out now. 
if you look on the dial scale, right here is 1.5 megahertz. You see where the pointer is? It's not on 1.5. And what you're going to find out is, all across the scale, it's not really super accurate. And because of that, you have to use external test equipment to set the frequency accurately on this. Now, if you don't really care, if you're just trying to set up a rough area and tune to it, this is good enough. But what if you want to set up an IF, and you want it to be precisely 455 kilohertz, okay? So if I go down to here, and I go to set it to 455, this little arrow, if you look right here, there's a little tiny arrow there. If you set this on there, that's supposed to be 455 kilohertz exactly. Okay? And if you look at the scope, you can see it's 450 to 451. All right? Um, so, it's not that accurate, okay? Now, some people will say, well, if you set it up at that, it'll work, you know, and that's true to an extent, but if you really want to get accurate with things, um, an IF is a tuned circuit, and it's designed around the, the IF frequency it was designed for, and if it's 455 kilohertz, you really want it as close to 455 as you can get it. So that kind of rendered this thing hard to use. Um, anytime you put anything on this output, you, you can affect things. So you really don't want anything other than your device connected to this. Um, so what do we do, you know? I, I don't want to have a scope on it all the time when I'm trying to set my frequency. And again, like I said, when you start going to low range, minimum, you know, for RF, you can see that very quickly let me get my get this thing to trigger you can see very quickly that you know the signal starts getting unstable at low frequencies or I mean at the low amplitudes you can see how noisy and kinda unstable it gets so even using your oscilloscope to measure it is not real easy. And this is a daggone good scope. This is a very good Tektronix, top of the line, you know, a digital phosphor scope. And even with it, you can see not that pretty when you're doing minimum output, you know, like you would when you're setting the sensitivity of a radio. So, what does that mean for all of us? Well, here's why I'm doing all this. Um, number one, I don't need this. I have other test equipment. But it is nice to have a simple device like this, if it were more accurate, to just use it. I don't like turning on my high-end expensive equipment um, for something that I could do with a simple generator like this. Um, and also, I think this is a good opportunity to share a video with you guys um, how to get into the hobby with some lower-end equipment but giving it a little bit of higher end features. So, let's go to our next little thing. If you go online, you can purchase one of these from eBay or Amazon or any other place. It's just a frequency counter. Now, this frequency counter is a cheap one. This was like 10 bucks. And if you look, I'm going to turn on some more lights here. We're going to get a little bit of glare on the scope, but we don't need that right now. But if we look here, this is only good for, as you can see right down here, it's only good for about 75 megahertz. Okay, so it, it won't measure the frequency all the way up of what this thing can do. Okay, but anything in the broadcast AM bands or the shortwave band. So if you're going to do a shortwave radio or you're going to do an AM radio, you're going to get into the just get into this. This will work very very well 
at measuring the frequency. Now, I tested this up against, you know, a really accurate um, RF signal source. And this thing was absolutely 100% dead accurate on. It was on. So it works very, very well. Um, all you need is, you know, a 9 volt power signal. And then you just plug a BNC connector into it, and boom, it reads the signal. So let's do that. Let's hook this up. I'm going to hook this up to some power, and we'll be right back. Okay. So basically, I have this hooked up to 9 volts, and I just have it plugged directly in to the signal generator, as we can see. All right. And when I shut the light out here to get rid of the glare, because this needs a, t a tinted glass window over it to be able to see the numbers properly. That's why you probably aren't seeing them. I'm not even having a very good time seeing them. But if we shut the lights off, um, you can see that... Uh, let me see if I can get a little bit of background light to help out illuminate this a little bit. There. Does that help any? A little bit. Okay. So, if you look, that's pretty much, 450 was pretty much what our scope was originally reading. Alright. And as we adjust it, you can see, we can set it very accurately if we want. There we go, 455. Okay. And I can really dial it down. Now, a little thing about how this one works, okay? If you notice, this little cursor is blinking here. See the little dot? When it's blinking, when it's flashing fast, that means that it's measuring kilohertz, not megahertz. Now, if I take this up, see how it is not flashing? There's the decimal point. That means it's megahertz. So that's how it differentiates between measuring kilohertz and megahertz. So let me go back down 455 and see how it's flashing. Go back up to megahertz not flashing. And you can see it's it's five digits so you get some pretty good resolution on this thing um, for the most part. So there we go. So 455 kilohertz and even though the if you look at the, the bezel, it's not really at 455. Um, it's not on the little arrow, but it's close. So the dial scale is not perfect on this thing. And now we have a solution for the dial scale. Now, here's where we're going to run into problems. I have the attenuation set to maximum. And... If I turn the signal down, okay, like you're going to use for testing your radio, all of a sudden, <laughs> as you turn this thing, it doesn't work properly. Okay, so you can see it kind of gets really kind of jittery. Now, just to show you, even though it's not reading right now, if I unplug this and I move it to my scope, there is, in fact, a signal there. Now, it's very small. It's only uh, 43 millivolts peak to peak. But you got to understand, when you're looking at an RF signal, you want it to be very, very low like that. You don't want it to overpower your um, your AGC circuit, okay? So again, perfect signal. I'm not touching anything on the signal generator. I go back over to here and I plug it into here, and as you can see, I just get garbage. Now, if I turn this amplitude up far enough it will eventually start to read. 
and the higher the frequency you get, the more critical that gets. So if I go to here and I go down, it'll drop off even faster. So this was almost a solution. I'm going to turn the lights back on. So it's almost a solution for this, but not perfect. So what are we going to do? Okay. So what I'm going to do is a couple of things. Number one, I don't want to put a T-piece in here with my output because I don't want anything here affecting my output. So I want to put an external connector on the back to be able to connect an external frequency counter, such as this one. That's number one. Number two, what we want to do is, let's look at the schematic for a minute. So if we look here, you see that? Okay. So if we look here, right here is your RF output. And if you trace it back, you have a capacitive decoupler here. You have a resistive divider network that is for high and low um, output, so you have a little padding circuit there. And then you have an attenuator, which is just a pot that goes to ground. But right here, at this transistor, okay, on the emitter of this, trans this NPN transistor, you actually have your output right here. Now what we want to do is, normally we would just tap off of this to go into the frequency counter. And probably, we could probably just take a capacitor to decouple and come off of this and go to that um, to a BNC connector and that will feed at full output all the time. That will feed our frequency counter. Now, if the frequency counter has a high enough input impedance, it probably won't affect any of this at all, and it'll just be like it's not even there. So, we will have to do a little bit of experimenting to see if we can just get away with that, and that's what I'm hoping for. If not, I do have a plan B. Okay, so plan B is a circuit called a high impedance buffer. Now, what is a buffer? A buffer is just a simple little circuit that kind of decouples a signal from another device. Okay, so it's kind of a, a, an intermediary thing. And what it's supposed to do is it will present a very high impedance to the signal. So it doesn't attenuate or affect the signal. Okay, and then the output, no matter what load you put on the output, it's not going to affect the input of this circuit. So, what do we mean by this? Well, if you take a look right here, it's a very simple circuit as an example, where we're using a JFET. Okay, a JFET is a very high impedance semiconductor. Okay, and Basically, we're putting a decoupling capacitor. We're going into the input of the JFET with a 10 mega ohm kind of bleeder resistor there. Okay. And then we're coming out of the JFET and we're amplifying that signal a little bit with an RF transistor. Now, what's the one thing, if you read the article on this, the one thing that he did, the gentleman did that, that designed this when they did this was this is actually a germanium transistor. Okay, there's two types of transistor material there's germanium and silicon. Silicon is the type you see today. All right, um, what's the difference? Well, the main difference is the voltage drop across the P and N junction of a semiconductor. If it's germanium, your voltage drop is much lower, it's you know around. 
three tenths of a volt or point zero point three volts whereas on a silicon transistor it's anywhere from 0.6 to 0.7 volt drop. Okay, so the operating conditions of the of germanium versus silicon are a little bit different. Germanium is kind of outdated. Nobody uses it anymore, but for this application it actually works really really well. So um, I do have if we need to breadboard this and see if we can mock this up, I do have an old germanium RF transistor and I do have a little uh, JFET it's probably not the same one as this but it should work again this circuit was designed to work up into you know high the high VHF low UHF frequencies um, these components here will only work well within the 75 megahertz that that this frequency counter will be working in and possibly even higher than that clear up into the FM broadcast band so again we're going to try just a decoupling capacitor first if that doesn't work we're going to put this buffer signal on there um, this or this little buffer circuit so that's our little project for today and if this works then maybe that'll be a little inspiration for all of you out there that are thinking of getting into radio uh, to be able to make your own test setup you can do a lot with this once we get this mocked up you'll see that you can using these modulation ports you can do an awful lot with this sig signal generator once you get it to a point where you get an accurate signal output um, and you're going to find out even on the tube type ones if you have an ICO 324 or a uh, Heathkit SG8 a lot of those old ones you can find them sometimes very inexpensively at flea markets or on eBay or online but it, they all have one thing in common and that is the dial scale is never super accurate and if you need something to be accurate you need a way to be able to monitor it as you're adjusting and it's a it's really a pain to hook up an oscilloscope with frequency measurement or try to hook up a frequency counter and get it to, to read and all the very difficult but if you have a separate frequency counter output it'll make all the difference in the world um, of how useful this device becomes like I said brand new these can be bought I've seen them as cheap as hundred and fifty dollars brand new which I think is not a bad price for a solid state um, frequency generator that goes up to this you know this high of a frequency um, so that's where we're at so let's get this thing cracked open and see what's inside let's look at some schematics and see what our options are all right so we got this apart and as you can tell there's not much going on in here really you have your coils with your band select you got basically the oscillator and you know the input and outputs right here um, your tuning capacitor and that's really it and this side is your power supply now I did a little bit of measuring and if you notice right here are those two diodes coming from the little transformer and we can see that right here and when I measure this point right here I'm getting about 25 volts DC now our frequency counter again needs a power range somewhere from 7 to 9 volts so I need about 9 volts DC for this to work right and I just so happen to have some of these little buck converters little DC to DC converter power supplies you can buy these online um, eBay and Amazon and Banggood and all those companies have them and they're very inexpensive they're only a couple of dollars like two dollars each and what they do is we can put our 25 volts in this can take up to 30 volts input 
and we can crank it down to about our 9 volts right here. And what I'm going to do is conveniently there is a pad. Let me zoom you in. There is a pad right here. The center pad is our 25 volts. It goes directly to the output of our diodes. And then one of these is our ground. This is all our ground bus along here. So I'm going to tack on my input wires to this pad here and to one of the ground pads here. And I've already conveniently mounted a couple of standoff posts right up here so that this will sit right here. Now this is out of the way. I don't think it's going to interfere in an RF ma manner. These do oscillate a little bit, so they could put off some noise. I'll see. I can make a little aluminum shield if we really, really need it, but I highly doubt it's going to affect anything. And uh, here's going to be our outputs. And what I intend to do is I have a bunch of these in stock. Uh, just the little power jack and a little power plug like that. And I'm going to connect that to this and mount that to the chassis. And then I have a BNC jack right here. And I have a little piece of coax I'm going to use. And I'm going to tap in right at this transistor here. Oh, sorry, right at the transistor. Okay. So right in this area is where we're going to look for our uh, signal out. I'm probably going to pick it off right here on this pot. And I'm just going to use an isolation capacitor. I'm probably going to use a small one. Um, you know, they're using right here, a, looks like a .0, I don't know what that is. What's that say to you? .03, .05, something like that. And I'm going to use like a .01 because we don't really need uh, too much to get out of there. So 0 0.01 should do fine, I would imagine. Um, again, I'm going to mock this up before I solder everything, but um, I'll get this power put in first. So that's where we are. When I get this put together a little further, we'll be back. Okay, as you can see, I have a little coupling cap here connected to the potentiometer input. And uh, I just mounted this terminal strip right on this convenient ground tab. And these two tabs is where we're going to come off with our uh, coax to go to the BNC connector. And I tested it out, and my signal stays nice and strong all the way through all the adjustments. So turn this on, you can see the little blue light there for the little uh, 9 volt power supply we put in and when we look up here on the oscilloscope can you all see that Let's see here what we're in the way get all this stuff out of the way here we go okay my mother's oh, hold on okay so we can see and I will flip through all of the frequency bandwidths and my scope just fell off. Oh. There we go. And you can see plenty of signal all the way to the max. Okay, so let's get this connected up. You can see we have our two connectors hooked up in there, and there they are in the back. So let's get this put together and see what it does. Okay, our project is complete, and I mounted it in a little box here, as you can see. Now I'll turn the lights on a little better here in a little bit. And you can see it's uh, working very well.
There's our. See now when we want our 455, we can dial right in. You can see the 455 kilohertz. You can see how touchy this adjustment is, and you can see how hard it would be to get this by just looking at that dial. So that makes this a lot uh, more useful piece of test equipment. And there you have it. So maybe we'll get a radio out if we can and do a couple little tests that uh, just some basic things. Um, for all of you who are really experienced with this, this is just review. You might want to just kind of skip through this, but for those of you who are new to the hobby, um, maybe we can look at how we use one of these on a radio. So let's get some things set up here and take a look. But uh, before we do that, we turn our lights back on. And I'll just show you what I did. If you look here, I just got a plastic project box. And I basically put a couple of standoffs back here, drilled a couple of holes for the wires, and then just mounted it in there. And then I just double stick taped it right to the top. And as you can see, there's our connectors on the back. Okay, and for those of you who are wondering about Cookie, here she is. Say hi, Cookie. Can you say hi? Hi? What? You gonna talk? Hmm? Hey, Cookie. No? All right. Well, there she is. And, of course, we can't leave Bella out of this. Come here, Bella. Come on, Pop. Hi, baby. <laughs> Good girl. Can you sit? Can you sit? No, because you're on, you're on the camera. Sit. Good girl. Good girl. All right. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, we have a little uh, radio here. It's an old Sentinel All-American 5 vacuum tube radio. And you can see it's been restored inside, but the radio's really hammered up pretty bad. The case on it was really damaged, um, but it's such a good performing little radio for what it is, um, I just kind of keep it around for test purposes. So as you can see, it's all plugged in and turned on right now. And you can see the one, two, three, four, five tubes. That's why they're called All American Fives. And we're going to do a couple little tests. Um, again, this is for this is for the beginners. Um, if you know, if you're really experienced with radio, this is not going to be much of any learning experience. But those of you new to the sport here, um, maybe you'll find this interesting. So now that you have a decent piece of test equipment, let's see what kind of things we can do with this. All right. Now the first thing we have to talk about is safety. Um, make sure whenever you work on this stuff, it's high voltage. You can get severely injured or even killed. Um, if you come in contact with the power in here, there's high voltages and they're very dangerous. So if you're not comfortable working around high voltages and you don't understand how to work around them, then stop and learn about that first. Remember, you are doing this at your own risk, and if you get injured, you know, uh, I can't be held responsible for that. So do this at your own risk. Now, one, one thing, when you work with these, this is called a hot chassis radio. The reason it's called hot chassis is because the plug is connected to this chassis on one end. So one end of this cord is connected to this chassis and depending how you plug it in this chassis could be set on the hot side of your AC line so if you touch this radio any part of the metal part of this radio and you touch something that's ground you're going to get a severe shock so anytime you work on these types of radios always 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 this should be the very first investment you make if you're going to work on old radios get yourself a isolation transformer. 
basically in this metal box is nothing but a transformer, a one-to-one -one transformer that basically has a primary winding and a secondary winding that do not touch one another physically and they transfer the power from your incoming line to the radio without any electrical connection in between. So what that does is that isolates your AC line from your radio. If you should accidentally come in contact with the chassis of the radio and something that's grounded, you will not get shocked because the transformer isolates, still isolates it from the ground. Now, that being said, you still can get shocked in the radio by completing the circuit inside the radio. So if you touch something like the chassis and then you touch something that's hot in this radio, you're still going to get shocked. Okay? But the isolation transformer prevents you from having a ground loop between the radio and you when you touch the radio and touch something that's earth ground. Okay? I hope that makes sense to you all. So again, one of your first things when you're going to work on these, get an isolation transformer. In my previous videos, I think a couple times we talk about that and I show them to you. So uh, make sure you understand that. Now, we have this all connected and warmed up. And as you can hear, we have some sound. Hear that? And it's picking up our station. Hear all the noises? Okay. Now, take a look up here at this, okay, at our frequency. Watch as I move it. Do you hear that sound? Hear how the sound goes away? Hear how it comes back? Now look at the frequency it goes away. Now it's gone. You hear that? Okay. Let's talk about that for a minute. What we were creating there was called a beat frequency. B-E-A-T. Why do we call that? Well, inside a super heterodyne radio, okay, you basically take you have two capacitors there. One is your antenna tuning capacitor. The other one is called your oscillator. And what your oscillator does is it will oscillate at a frequency that is about, in this case, 455 kilohertz off, higher or lower, than the, the actual antenna tuned frequency. By, at, by subtracting those apart, the difference is always going to be the 455 kilohertz difference, okay? We call that our intermediate frequency. Now, I'm not doing a, a lesson on radios here right now. We're just going to, I'm just giving you a brief synopsis so you understand what we're looking at. So, the bottom line is, if I feed 455 kilohertz into this radio, it should pass right through the, the antenna, and it should sync up with that 455 kilohertz difference between these two oscillators here, the antenna and the local oscillator. And it should, because it's, they sync up, I should be able to put a tone, okay, so that modulated tone, you hear it? Hear that sound? And you can hear, there's the tone. Now, as you notice, I'm really not connecting any physical wires. Okay? In behind here is your antenna. This is the bar antenna. And all I'm doing is bringing this little loop of wire in close proximity to the antenna. See that? Now, all I have is just a BNC cable with some alligator clips on the end, crocodile clips if you want to call them that, and I just have a couple of turns of just solid, plain solid wire taped together to make a little loop, okay? We call this just a loop radiator. 
and by placing it in proximity of the antenna I am actually making a mini radio station and I'm transmitting on 455 kilohertz it's supposed to be and a modulation of 1 kilohertz okay so that simulates music or, or sound into the radio and that's what you're hearing with that that's a 1 kilohertz tone if I turn off the modulation then I just have a plain old carrier signal. Now if I turn that off, see that? And you start hearing radio stations. You hear that? Okay. If I turn it up, see? Okay. Now, Again, I said 455 kilohertz, but look where it's at. Okay, now watch what happens. Hear it get higher, and now watch me go down. Did you hear that squeal go away? There's the squeal. Now it's gone. Now look up here at our frequency. That is what we call zero beat. When, when the two frequencies, the frequency in this and the frequency in the local oscillator here, or the, the intermediate frequency, the IF, are equal, they're synced up. So you don't hear any difference between those two signals beating against one another and making a tone. So listen, no sound, but when I get off of my zero beat, hear that? Now what am I doing? Why am I doing all this and why am I wasting so much time on it? Well, what, what I'm showing you is an easy way to tell with your signal generator if your IF frequency is properly calibrated, okay? Technically, if this were done correctly, at 455 kilohertz we should see that zero beat but if you look on this radio it's at 456.69 or 456.7 see if we go to 455 right about There's 454 point, right, pretty close to 455 right there, okay? And as you can see, it's not zero beaded, okay? So, in this case, we would want to adjust our intermediate frequency, so we're going to adjust these little cans to get rid of that sound, okay? Or, better yet, we're going to do it the way that they show you in the, in the instructions, okay? So, if you don't have any way of putting modulation, putting a tone on that frequency, okay, on that carrier frequency, then we could adjust it this way, all right? Hold on a second. Okay, I got a tweaker out here. So, so this is out of whack. Now, if we turn on our modulation, there's your sound. You want to turn it down till it starts getting real staticky. Get back up to 455, I bumped it. There. You want to set your signal till it's nice and quiet, or till it's nice and uh, way down, just barely picking up the signal. Okay. See that? And then. And if you look at our meter. 
Ja. Now watch what happens now. Hear how it's getting louder? And watch the meter. Very hard to peek it. When you go to this one. Let me get a different tweaker out. Okay, let's try this one. Watch the meter. There you go. Okay, that's enough of that noise, huh? And what we're doing is we're zeroing this in get a quieter spot. There. There we go. And right there. Hear it? As we go past it, and we go past it again. Right there. And there you go. Now, let me show you what I was doing with this meter here. Sorry about the loud noise. But we were adjusting for the peak on the meter. See that? Right like that. Okay. And there you have it. So, that's our first thing, okay? So, now that we know that we have an accurate frequency on here, we were able to accurately set this to these two IF coils to 455 kilohertz. Now, whenever you do an alignment on an old radio like this, almost all of them are going to work this same way. Now, some of the really old ones have really odd... Um, intermediate frequencies and I suggest you read up on super heterodyne um, or look at some of my other videos talking about some of that but uh, you're always going to start out by adjusting your IF once you do that you can hear that then you're going to want to do for your you know for your dial and what that's going to mean is you're going to do something at the top of the dial and something at the bottom of the dial so, for instance, and this is how you set your dial accuracy. Now, on this radio, we obviously don't have a pointer for our dial, so we can't really do it. But essentially what you're going to do is you're going to go all the way to one end, you know, near 1600 kilohertz or 1 1.6 megahertz, and you're going to move this up to 1.6. 6 megahertz, let's say. Right there. You can see where we're set. And when we tune up wide open, you see there? So I'm tuning with the capacitor open. That should be right on 1.6 megahertz and when you get it when you set the dial to 1.6 megahertz and you set your oscillate your uh, signal generator to 1.6 megahertz then you're going to use your little adjusters here for your oscillators to trim it in right at 1600 what will happen is sometimes if you tune the dial to 1.5 megahertz and you're picking up 1.6 megahertz that means your your dial accuracy is set wrong and so in order to adjust that you're adjusting these two little trimmers 
on these capacitors down here. So if I kind of zoom you in here, you have these little tiny screws. Those are actually little capacitors. There's a little piece of spring steel like copper with some mica, a little piece of mica behind there. And when you turn that, it actually adds or subtracts a wee little bit of capacitance to these two capacitors here. And what that does is that lets you exactly have the dial set to 1.6 megahertz and then have, have you actually tuning 1.6 megahertz. So the dial matches the station. Okay. So for instance, if you're tuning in a station that you know is radio 790, let's say, but you're up around 820, and tuning in radio 790 on 820, you know that your dial is set wrong. So that would be these little screws here. One of them you use, you set at a high frequency. Then you would go back over to here, and you would change your band, and we would take it maybe to 520, or five, let's say 525, okay, somewhere around 525, and then you would take and tune your dial down here, see there, and you hear that sound I'm picking up? We're actually picking up some noise from an electronic device on my bench. Most likely <clears throat> this signal generator up here. You see how this little LED flashes? It's like your your power indicator that you know this is the power switch. Why they would do this for a signal generator is beyond me. This is not my favorite signal generator. It generates more crap and more noise. I can't do any radio work with this thing plugged in. I have to unplug it and get rid of it. Um, but you can see that's, you see how that flashes on and off, and it kind of does it in step with that sound. Okay, and that's what you're picking up. It's pretty bad. Or maybe it's this. Nope. So, anyway, ignore the little beeping. And then you would go ahead and you would adjust this other screw over here. I'm jumping all over the place on this video, guys. I'm sorry. Okay. So basically, aligning a, an AM radio like this is as simple as that. Okay. You set your IF, go to 455 kilohertz, take a little loop of antenna here, a little loop wire, place it in proximity of your antenna to couple it up. Then you go in and you adjust your, your first and second IF, okay? Most of these radios have two IF. Some of them have one, some of them have three. It depends on the radio. Some of the higher quality radios even have an RF section um, that will boost the antenna signal before it turns it into an IF signal. Um, those will usually have an extra tube. You'll see a sixth tube in there. But anyhow, we're not going to get into that. Most of them are like this. Most of the little radios you get on, you know, in the flea market or whatever will be these All-American 5s. And they'll have your two IF cans and your two little trimmers on your main capa on your tuning capacitor. And you always start with your IF first, your 455 kilohertz. Then you set the high scale of the dial and the low scale of the dial. And then once you get those four settings adjusted, your, your radio is calibrated. That's all there is to it. And you can tune by ear, as you heard, when you, when you do get these things on frequency, your modulation signal, your one, you know, 1 kilohertz or 400 hertz, whichever tone your signal generator makes, this one does a 1 kilohertz tone, it'll get louder. Or you can go across the speaker like I did with this you know, with the, with the little VTVM meter, get yourself a cheap VTVM on, you know, on a flea market or whatever, and you can adjust using the needle to peak it. This is more accurate, but you have to have the radio turned up loud enough to deflect the meter. Now, there is ways that you can go into the circuit of the radio down by the, uh, where the AGC is, and you can pick off the signal, bef you know, 
before it goes into the speaker so you can have the speaker turned down but I'm not going to show you how to do that today that's too much to talk about right now though for the sake of simplicity you go across your speaker terminals with your AC VTVM meter you use your little needle to peek out like we did adjust your two IFs first IF second IF and then go change your frequency on here to 1.4 1.5 megahertz 1.6 something like that adjust that the first trimmer and then go down to 520 kilohertz or 600 kilohertz and tune that in and then adjust that the other adjuster and that's it simple as that there's nothing to it so and you can see I did all the alignment of the radio from the top in other words in this particular case I never even had to take the bottom of the radio off okay and so some of them may have more than one uh, coil they may have a primary side and a secondary side at which case you may have another one of these adjusters in the bottom of this little coil here okay and that you would reach in from the bottom of the chassis and you would adjust both of them and then both of these okay so just depends on the radio and like I said it's usually a little one page instruction if you get the manual like from nostalgiaair.com or somebody like that and you get the uh, schematics and the uh, adjustment instructions it's one page and it's, it'll tell you how to do it. it's very simple so I hope that helps you guys out I know that uh, this is a nice nice little piece of test equipment now I'll probably use it um, you know you've all seen me use the HP you know 8657 up here and uh, I really like it it's super accurate it does a lot of things but I really don't like using expensive test equipment for little things like this if I don't really need to um, when I could just fire up this little thing and dial it in and use it and now that I have a good frequency counter we're good I'll be able to use it more often so now that this thing's tuned in I mean I'm in the basement of my house just to give you a little idea and I'm at the bottom of a hill and even with that I can pick up some stations what a great game that is going turning around there's that sound again So, you get an idea. Your son, who's got a chance to play now in the state championships with his high school team, and it it begs the question for me. So there you go, all nice and tuned in. And as you can see, it was off a little bit. Um, the IF was off a wee little bit, so that that got it tuned right in. Just as simple as that. So. I hope that was, uh, I know this was a kind of a long video for a lot of nothing, so for those of you who were bored and wanted to kill some time, there you go. Um, for the rest of you that uh, kind of suffered through this whole thing, uh, hopefully we get something more interesting coming up here pretty soon. I really need to do that Pioneer um, SX1050. Um, I know I've done a video on one of those before. The video turned out real choppy. Uh, what I'm probably going to do is I'll probably bring this other SX1050 up on the bench. I'll do a preliminary video on it, and I'll ask you all if you want to see the whole thing, uh, the whole restoration. I'm going to get into pretty deep detail on it, and uh, if you're interested in seeing another step-by-step -step of yet another piece of Pioneer gear, I don't know why it's turning out this way, but it just seems like all I've had lately is Pioneer. But... Uh, I'll be happy to go through all that. Um, if you're uh, not interested in that, I, my, my feelings won't be hurt, I understand. And uh, I'll just do it off camera. And uh, when I come back, I'll have something else up on the bench. 
So uh, you all have yourselves a great day, and uh, thanks for coming along on this. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm really kind of surprised at this little frequency counter, how well it works. Right up, to, And I did take it right up to 75 megahertz, and it looked really good. So uh, I highly recommend it. Um, again, if you search eBay for uh, frequency counter um, or frequency counter module, uh, this will come right about a hundred of these will pop up and they're cheap. They're like all 10, 15 bucks uh, you know, American. And uh, really all you need is a 9 volt source and a BNC connector and you know a wire to plug in here. And it's ready to go right out of the box. I think you can also buy these in kit form for a dollar or two cheaper if you want to solder up the parts and practice on that. Um, I got mine pre-assembled. And uh, I guess that's all there is to this. Uh, I am probably going to get some, some tinted film to put over here to make this easier to read um, in the future. But other than that, this is going up on the bench and it'll be a, a nice quick little test thing that I can use uh, for working on these little radios. So thanks again and uh, we'll catch you on the next one.